I found an enormous appetite for information about the world that they've been isolated from. I'm talking about ordinary Iranians and a very distinct lack of interest among ordinary Iranians in um, initiating a conflict with the state of Israel. What was more surprising was that even among some senior Islamic leaders, I interviewed two grand ayatollahs, I interviewed some senior ayatollahs, and I interviewed members of the parliament, and I found that while there was not one warm word among any of them about the state of Israel, in several cases I saw that there was a diversity of opinion about whether the problem was Israel's mere existence or whether it was the policies. I had an ayatollah who is uh, very close to the senior leadership tell me that the problem is Israel's violation of international law. In one case, I interviewed a former commander of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, and um, he was virulently anti-Zionist, and excuse me, but in my opinion, because of some of his statements, which you can find in the story, he was also anti-Semitic. He talked about Jewish international conspiracies. But when asked if he would accept a two-state solution where one negotiated, he said, basically, we are not inclined to be more Palestinian than the Palestinians. Do you think that some of those views were being expressed to you because, after all, these were people who were willing to talk to an American Jewish journalist? That These were perhaps, I mean, they may have been surprising, but they weren't entirely representative. It's a fair question. I had some ideas of people I wished to speak with, and I was nobody put any barriers in my way in doing so. But by and large, a lot of these people are associated with the current government under Rouhani, in one way or another, uh, they're supportive of it. And the real issue is what about the supreme leader and the hardliners who um, also oppose the very existence of the state of Israel? The main thing I came away with is the understanding that this was a matter of debate. It was not a uniform position. Were you able to talk at all to members of the Jewish community in, inside Iran and, and get a sense of how freely they're allowed to practice and to operate? Yes. I, I feel like I did get some insight into that. I spent a fair amount of time with members of the Jewish community, both in Tehran and in Shiraz. And um, I would like to use some shorthand that covers up a very, that explains a very complicated situation. But basically, I saw them as well-protected, somewhat second-class citizens, but secure and well-protected, and for the most part, middle-class and prosperous. They put it this way, and this was what was impressive to me, they are very vocal about areas in which they feel discriminated against. In their view, they are discriminated against, for example, in the area of so-called blood money compensation under Sharia law. If a Muslim kills a Jew, the amount of compensation the Jew can get is much different than the amount of compensation a Muslim gets if a Jew kills a Muslim, the Muslim family gets. They're very vigorous in protesting against this. They're also very vigorous in pushing the government to open up senior government positions to them. They feel like they can enter government and work in government, but that the senior directorships are denied to them and they don't like it, and they're pushing against that. They have several Jewish schools in Tehran. They have a Jewish hospital in Tehran. They have about 13 operating synagogues in Tehran. In the Jewish school, the Jewish kids are getting a very nice education, but the principal is Muslim under the code and laws of the country. And the head of the Jewish community told me he found that insulting. That was the word he used, and I was impressed that he used that word on the record. And um, they are pushing on various areas to attain equality and to attain changes in the laws and regulations under which they feel they're disadvantaged. It sounds from what you're saying, both about members of the Jewish community and, and obviously the majority of Iranians who you spoke to who, who aren't Jewish, who are Muslim, that actually people were willing to talk to you relatively freely. The sense that dissent is not tolerated is, is perhaps erroneous. There's no freedom of the press in Iran in the way that we would understand it, but there is something I would call freedom of tongue that was very obvious and very evident to the extent that not only were people willing to criticize the government on the record, they were willing to go on video to do it, and you can see the videos on our website. Can I ask if the newspaper you work for, The Forward, has an editorial view on whether the deal between the international powers and Iran on Iran's nuclear program is a good thing or not? I'm the news editor, and I don't get involved in the editorial, but I can give you as a point of information that the paper has editorialized that 
the agreement has to be examined very carefully. It has not yet taken a position on the agreement itself. You're now in Israel, Larry. I'm wondering what sort of reception you're getting from people there when you say you never guessed where I was last month. Well, I got here only an hour ago and I'm with my cousins and uh, they're quite surprised to hear about this. And uh, the uh, uh, immigration officer who saw the Iran stamp in my visa was also surprised. And um, of course, you, you, you to... went in with the same passport. You didn't have two passports. No, I only have one passport. That's extraordinary. And you were let in. To Israel or to Iran? Which no, to Israel, with a stamp from an Iranian visa in your passport. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it, it was a cause of remark, but it was not a cause for barring my entry. That's remarkable. And the immigration officer was curious. She wanted to know what I thought of it, what, what happened there. And then she tried to draw me into a conversation about what I thought regarding the current clash between Netanyahu and our president, uh, Barack Obama. But... Uh, reporter that I am, I said, well, that's my job to report on. And we moved on and I got into the country and piled into a car and I'm now at my cousin's house.